This module begins a series of videos that will explore remote sensing in the microwave portion of the EM spectrum. In this module, we'll look into some of the basic similarities and differences between passive remote sensing in the IR or visible wavelengths compared to microwave frequencies. Recall from the beginning of the course that the microwave part of the EM spectrum encompasses much larger wavelengths than IR or visible radiation. The microwave radiation in this red box over here that we'll discuss in this class is situated mostly in a region of medium to high atmospheric absorptivity. So attenuation or extinction of radiation is a big concern for many microwave frequencies. Because of its longer wavelength, microwave radiation is generally not as susceptible to scattering as shorter infrared and visible radiation. Therefore, microwaves can more efficiently penetrate features that IR and visible light cannot. In particular, microwaves are used to see emissions through clouds and layers of liquid water and soil. However, emittance of microwave radiation by Earth is much smaller than its infrared emissions. Therefore, the spatial resolution of microwave data is generally less than that of IR data. This also requires that passive and active microwave instruments operate in low Earth orbit. As a result, the temporal resolution of space-based microwave data also, the return period of a satellite to a point on the surface can be several days. However, constellations of multiple satellites with microwave instruments can help account for the reduced temporal resolution. Typically, in the microwave part of the spectrum, we refer to bands by their frequency rather than wavelength. The frequency, denoted here with Greek letter nu, is just the speed of light, or about 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by the wavelength of the radiation involved. Henceforth in this course, we will use frequency when referring to passive microwave and wavelength when referring to passive IR or visible remote sensing. The frequencies we're dealing with in the microwave are small enough so that we can re-express the Planck black body equation as a linear function of temperature. For microwaves at long wavelength, the ratio in the exponent in the denominator becomes very small. We can use the fact that the natural exponential function for small exponents simplifies to 1 plus the exponent to remove the exponent from the denominator and simplify this equation. After doing some algebra to cancel like terms in the fraction, we're left with the following expression. That simply states that the microwave blackbody radiance is linearly proportional to temperature. Thus, the radiance L is just emissivity times the Planck radiance, and we can define a microwave brightness temperature, T sub B, that is simply emissivity multiplied by the actual temperature. As we will soon see, this means we can substitute radiances for temperatures in Schwarzschild's equation. Note before we move on that in the IR, we often assume that emitters on Earth, and especially the ocean, could be approximated as black bodies. This is most certainly not the case in the microwave, however. And furthermore, the emissivity of the ocean changes as the properties of the ocean surface change, as we'll discuss in the last slide. Thus, the emissivity term becomes very important for microwave remote sensing. In the top right panel, Frequencies associated with corresponding wavelengths on the bottom axis are shown along the x-axis. Between roughly 10 and 50 gigahertz, the atmosphere is relatively optically thin. So let's suppose for an idealized case in one of these optically thinned, thin regions, we have a homogeneous single layer atmosphere with some temperature. The surface radiance is that from emission by the surface and reflectance. And then sources along the path include emissions only from the atmosphere. The general form of Schwarzschild's equation is shown at the top of this slide. With the atmospheric radiance at the top of or the top of atmosphere radiance on the left hand side. If we suppose that the atmosphere has a depth h and a volume extinction coefficient of sigma e, which is just the volume absorption coefficient in this case, the, the optical depth is just 
h times sigma e, which we can use to define the direct transmissivity. We know that the portion of the top of the atmosphere radiance that's emitted by the atmosphere is just the Planck radiance of the atmosphere multiplied by the absorptivity of the atmosphere, which is this right here. And we know that the absorptivity of the atmosphere through Kirchhoff's law is simply the emissivity of the atmosphere. This B times one minus tau also represents the downward emission of microwave radiation by the atmosphere that may later be reflected off the surface and back to space. We can then express the top of atmosphere radiance as a function of Planck radiance as follows here at the bottom. The first term represents radiation emitted by the surface that is transmitted all the way to the top of the atmosphere. Note the presence of the emissivity term at the beginning, which is shown as a function of temperature and salinity. The second term in the middle here captures the radiance emitted by the atmosphere, the B times one minus tau, that is reflected off the surface, which where the reflection is represented by one minus epsilon, that is transmitted all the way through the atmosphere, which is described by this last tau term. The reflectance is one minus emissivity because the emissivity equals the absorptivity and all radiation not absorbed is scattered off the surface. The final term describes emissions from the atmosphere directly to space. Using the linearization that we worked through earlier, however, we can convert the radiances to temperatures to express brightness temperature as parts of contributions from surface emissions, surface reflections, and atmospheric emissions. Two gases, water vapor and molecular oxygen, contribute to absorption of microwaves as seen in this piece of the absorption, absorb absorbance spectrum of the atmosphere. Therefore, the direct transmittance of the atmosphere is dependent heavily on wavelength and water vapor concentration in the atmosphere. Like in the IR, we can take advantage of these absorption bands to garner information about profiles of temperature and humidity in the atmosphere using multispectral sounders. While scattering of microwaves is not as prevalent as scattering of visible light, Complicated scattering patterns can still occur in clouds, especially at high frequencies. We especially take advantage of this scattering in active microwave remote sensing, or radar, which we'll discuss in the next lecture series. The equation currently shown at top is an expression of the volume scattering coefficient. It is dependent on the size of scattering objects, r is the radius, the number of objects, so the greater the number, the more the scattering, and the so-called scattering efficiency, represented here by Q, or Q sub S. The scattering efficiency is depicted by the plot at bottom left, which shows how Q varies as a function of size parameter. You might recall that the size parameter is related to the ratio of the circumference of a scatterer to the wavelength of the radiation interacting with the scatterer. The scattering efficiency is a complicated looking function that also depends on the imaginary component of the index refraction M prime, which is just related to the absorption properties of the scatterer. So that the smaller M prime, the less absorption there is. We presume that a significant scattering interaction happens if the size parameter exceeds one. For air molecules, at least the size parameter can occur for radiation at wavelengths of about 600 nanometers or less. However, for typical raindrops, which are larger, about one millimeter in radius or so, radiation shorter than six millimeters can encounter significant scattering. This corresponds particularly with bands at frequencies greater than 50 gigahertz. However, larger raindrops cause appreciable scattering at even lower frequencies. The plot at right should be familiar from earlier in the quarter. It helps to visualize the differences between scattering of microwave, which is over here, 
from the plot versus IR or visible radiation. We can then explore in more detail how clouds might impact microwave radiative transfer. We can effectively see through aerosols and air molecules at any microwave frequency, but our ability to see through clouds depends on the frequency. The first column in this table shows frequencies on the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program Special Sensor Microwave Imager, or just known as SSMI. The corresponding wavelengths for each frequency are shown in the second column. The critical radius of a scattering object is given in the rightmost column. It is the wavelength of radiation divided by 2 pi, the radius required to obtain a size parameter of 1. The 91 gigahertz band, or the highest frequency band on the imager on the SSMIS instrument, encounters significant scattering when it interacts with objects that are at least half a millimeter in radius. Plenty of liquid water drops and precipitating clouds are near or exceed this size. As we move to lower frequencies, larger objects are required to achieve a significant scattering interaction. The 19 gigahertz band, for example, requires an object that is half a centimeter in diameter to cause a significant scattering interaction. This would be a very large raindrop. Therefore, low frequencies that are not heavily absorbed are generally able to see some properties of the surface. However, because the atmosphere is not completely transparent at any of the frequencies listed, any brightness temperatures would contain contributions from both the surface and the atmosphere. The higher frequencies, however, such as the 91 gigahertz, are more likely to not see emission from the surface at all because that radiation is exposed to both scattering and absorption in the atmosphere. And this is especially true in locations where there is lots of water vapor, such as in the tropics. The upshot of this is that as hydrometeors in a cloud increase in size, the optical depth along a path through the cloud to a satellite also increases. We can insert various hypothetical values of atmospheric temperature and transmissivity into our equation shown here uh, for brightness temperature to see the impact of clouds on brightness temperature over the ocean. And specifically, we're talking about microwave brightness temperature still. Consider the hypothetical single layer atmosphere on the left. The surface temperature is 280 Kelvin and the air temperature is 260 Kelvin. We'll assume that the cloud on the left is optically thin and so that the direct transmittance of the atmosphere in this example is 0.9. The cloud on the right is optically thick so that the direct transmittance we'll say is zero. Very importantly, suppose the emissivity of the ocean is 0.4, a typical value which is also dependent upon frequency. If we plug all these values into our equation, like we're doing up here, just above the figure, we see that the optically thin atmosphere actually has the lower brightness temperature, which is in contrast to what you would expect with IR. In fact, the brightness temperature is well lower than the temperature we would expect for any surface on Earth to have. Thus, at low microwave frequencies, the low brightness temperatures typically correspond with few or no clouds. This is in contrast with the IR brightness temperatures, which generally are largest in a cloud-free environment. The figure on the right over here, these lines, shows the implication of this on estimations of rain rate from microwave brightness temperatures. The low brightness temperatures, which are shown on the y-axis, these low brightness temperatures down here correspond with near zero rain rate, the variable on the x-axis, over ocean, which are denoted by the dashed lines. However, because land is much more emissive of microwaves than water, we expect to see high brightness temperature over land in cloud-free areas, which is denoted by these solid lines, and you see they all go to about 270 Kelvin when the rain rate is zero. Over the ocean, as we continue to the right on the x-axis, rain rates will eventually increase as the brightness temperature decrease. 
This is because, eventually, no radiation from the poorly emitting ocean reaches the top of the atmosphere, and only the emissions from near the tops of clouds reach space. Frequencies that are more susceptible to scattering and absorption, like 85 or 91 gigahertz radiation, generally have brightness temperatures that decrease as cloudiness increases for all but very dry atmospheres. However, lower frequencies can be less straightforward to interpret. As you can see, a 240 Kelvin brightness temperature at 18 gigahertz, looking at this dashed line and then this solid line and drawing a line across here at 240, this could correspond to a rain rate of either 10 millimeters per hour or where the dashed line corresponds with the solid line at higher rain rates of up to 50 millimeters per hour. We'll address this ambiguity that arises in interpreting brightness temperatures over ocean in a future module. Finally, this rather complicated plot shows the effects of various surface or atmospheric properties on brightness temperature at three SSMIS channels. 19 in blue, 22 in magenta, and 37 in red gigahertz. The x-axis on this plot is frequency, and the y-axis represents the change in brightness temperature, this delta Tb, that occurs as a result of a change in one of the properties plotted. That's just what the delta P is. It could be any of these things listed on the slide. The plus and minus signs represent the sign of this change in the brightness temperature. That corresponds with a positive change in any of the variables plotted. For example, the yellow line represents the effect of water vapor on brightness temperature at various frequencies. It is always above zero on the y-axis, meaning that increases in water vapor concentration cause increases in microwave brightness temperatures at all the frequencies shown. There is a peak in sensitivity of brightness temperature to water vapor at 22 gigahertz, which is located in a water vapor absorption band. Therefore, a 22 gigahertz sensor will detect less radiation emitted by the surface because much of the surface radiation is absorbed and re-emitted by water vapor. Of course, if there were no water vapor, then it may see emissions from the surface in that case. Since the satellite sees more radiation from the atmosphere normally, which is more emissive than the ocean, the brightness temperature at 22 gigahertz is often higher as the water vapor concentration increases. And this is true to some extent at the other frequencies as well. Likewise, brightness temperature generally increases in all bands as liquid water concentration increases, as noted by the green line. We can tell that the 37 gigahertz radiation is more sensitive to liquid water than 19 gigahertz radiation, consistent with our discussion of scattering from before. Brightness temperature is sensitive to salinity, primarily at frequencies less than 10 gigahertz, because ocean emissivity at those frequencies is dependent upon salinity. Brightness temperature generally increases as wind speed increases at all frequencies because the rougher ocean surface is a little more emissive. And finally, the temperature of the ocean surface affects its emissivity. The effect of surface ocean temperature on brightness temperature varies in a complicated way, often changing sign as a function of wavelength or frequency. For the frequency shown, emissivity generally in or for the frequency shown, emissivity generally decreases as the frequency increases. In fact, surface temperature will increase the 19 gigahertz brightness temperature if the surface temperature increases, but an increase in the surface temperature will decrease the 22 gigahertz brightness temperature. If the differences in brightness temperature between bands due to liquid water or water vapor, and perhaps wind speed, can be constrained, then various bands can be used together to help estimate surface temperature as well. Passive microwave observations are indeed used in concert with infrared radiances and surface data to create global analyses of sea surface temperature, as well as other variables, as we'll see in subsequent modules.